Oh no, you're not gonna start with zombie noises. Right. Oh, no. no. <laughs> so, hello and welcome to the 16th episode of the Split Screen Podcast. Um, uh, yeah, it's been like, how long has it been? About six months? So, uh, our, because our podcasts are timeless, I'm going to choose to not think about how long it's been. Uh, we're here because it is December, and that means instead of uh, sitting in my mum's living room frantically typing up the best games of the year, we thought we'd try something a bit different this year, um, and in order to get our thoughts going, we're going to talk about The Walking Dead. Any of that seem important to you? All of it, but that box never shuts up. Sit in this seat and pay too much attention and you'll drive yourself crazy. You'll have to learn to stop worrying about things you can't control. It goes to show, people will up and go mad when they believe their life is over. Oh, I got another good one for you. This one's a little bit less depressing and a bit more hilarious if I do say so. Watch out! This other time... Almost after the second episode, certainly both of us were very convinced that this was something very special. Yeah, I mean, you've always been a fan of the, the Telltale games. You're a big Sam and Max buff, but it's not something I would traditionally get into. And mm. then you were like, oh, you have to play the, the first episode of this. And I was like, yeah, this is pretty good. And then once I started getting into it, I was like, wow, so this is pretty amazing. And then suddenly I was recommended to everybody, you know bought it for friends for their birthdays and things and then but everybody was talking about it yeah pretty if not from the first episode then certainly from the second i think it's almost been like one of those little phenomenons like game of thrones in a way where if you know there's a certain person who's into that kind of thing this is a guaranteed uh that they're gonna find something that they can enjoy within it yeah um and the walking dead i don't know about you but my first kind of experience was it was with the comics obviously like back in the university a friend gave me them and mm. um his line was like no one is safe. And that, that's always been the, the tagline that I've had in mind whenever I've come across anything about The Walking Dead, be it the TV show or this game, was that no one is safe. You could turn a page and literally half of the cast get wiped out uh, just in some cataclysmic event. Um, I got into it with the TV show. Mm. Um, so it was my first experience, which I don't think was a great way to get introduced to it because, I mean, I've, I've had a leaf through the comics in a comic shop, but comparing the, the TV show to the games and the comics, I definitely think the TV show is the weakest link of the three. Mm, well, it's, it's, it soon won't be because, of course, there's an FPS coming out. Oh, Christ. What, what I think is really great about The Walking Dead and that, that whole zombie genre is all about um, kind of building up the suspense whenever they're not being attacked by zombies. Obviously, the whole point, the threat isn't the zombies. The zombies are just there in the background. They're just dressing, and they'll come out. <laughs> they'll come out. An arm will come through a window every now and then. It's it's the human to human interaction, which is where all of the yeah. terror comes from. That's where all the true fear comes from. Well, this is where if you compare something like classic zombie games, are your Resident Evils, and now you could you kind of left for dead, Dead Islands, where mm. the zombies are just fodder, really. Um, but you know, Resident Evil was in many ways a puzzle game. Left for Dead's a, a cooperative game, but it's not so much about. There's no drama between the characters, whereas mm. I guess the kind of zombie stuff I really like, like I'm a big fan of the. Romero uh, dead movies yeah, of course, and of course. those films aren't about people munching and killing zombies at least the early ones, certainly Dawn of the Dead and Night of the Living Dead aren't, they're about how do people react with each other whenever the laws of society break down, how do they interact in an apocalypse, yeah, that's I mean, where the Walking Dead game does that very well that no zombie game's ever really done before. I think like if I was to think of the, the holy three zombie games you've got, <laughs> uh, for me Dead Rising, which is all about self-preservation yeah. You've got Left for Dead, which is about working with other people. And then now The Walking Dead is about actually having to distrust certain people and having to watch those relationships a bit more. It's about self-preservation of the group rather than just the individual. I guess to actually, to actually start talking about the game controversially, mm -hmm. um, how many times have you been watching a, a zombie film or playing a game and somebody does something stupid, the lead character does something stupid, and you're like screaming at the TV going, why? Why would you do that? It's like, don't go after your dog, you know? You're going to get munched here, you're going to get killed. Um, but what Walking Dead's quite good at doing is that it gives you decisions to make, and it gives those decisions consequences, but it's not an, it's, it's not an obvious decision most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the early ones is, uh, you, the first episode, you're in a pharmacy, and you have to choose one of two people to save. And it's pretty apparent that one of those people's going to die. Oh, yeah, it's pick left or pick mm -hmm. right. 
um, you've got two people in trouble, you're not going to get to both in time. You kind of have that feeling. Um, well, it was Carly and guy who's not Carly. It's uh, yeah. There's the it's the reporter who has a gun, and then the sort of techy geeky guy. Um, and I know I went. I was thinking like, oh, oh, immediately, like so soon into the first episode, I was like, she's got the gun. I was trying to keep aware of like, well, who's got what? And I don't know these people yet, so I just went for the gun. And I think it uh, it gives us lesser odds for an apocalypse. The fact that neither of us chose to save the nerdy techie guy. <laughs> Though apparently, <laughs> apparently later on, and well, okay, you're saying like the consequences like that are obvious in that yeah. that scenario. Um, also, in the first episode, it's actually one of the first times that. Um, it really crept up, and it was quite quite interesting that they put the subtle options, uh, subtle consequences before the blatant ones. You come across a little girl. The entire story of this game, your character called Lee, and you come across Clementine, a little girl on her own, and it's really you're trying to sort of save her and mm-hmm. keep her, and she's um, often the light that you're trying to hold on to and move forward with. You find her, you find some other people, and guys say, "How do you know this kid?" We shouldn't be out in the open like this. How about you help us clear the way and we'll take you and your daughter out of here and down to my family's farm. It should be safer there. I'm not a dad. I'm just some guy. Some guy? Yeah. She's alone? Let's get going. Staying put for too long is a mistake. And I've just come out of this as of 10 minutes into it. It's like, oh, you know, I'm just some guy. And the options were like, I'm I'm her father, I'm her parents. Other one was option, I don't know this person. I'm just some guy. All right, forget Mm -hmm. it. I'm just some guy. Let's deal with what we're dealing with. Next scene, we get introduced to someone else. This character now says, oh, this is Lee. You've brought a couple guests. Your boy's a lifesaver. Glad he could be a help to somebody. So it's just you and your daughter, then? Oh, not his daughter. He's, well, just some guy who found her alone. Honey, do you know this man? Yes. He's just some guy. But he says that to the sheriff of the town. I was uh-huh. like, "Oh, I need to watch what I'm saying now." Yeah, I didn't yeah. even realize that that was something that's gonna that could put, even come back and hit me, and like that was just great. So then that that put me in a state where, you know, I, it's not that I need to watch my words. It was just to be aware that someone can come back. There was a memory to what you did in the game. It's certainly mm-hmm. a memory yeah, to what you there's said. A, there's, a, there's a history, mm-hmm. and there's more. There's even more things that you're not quite sure what's going to happen where the I think it's the end of the second episode when you come across an abandoned car yes. and you can choose to steal from the car or not mm-hmm. and uh, without spoiling it too much because obviously we're at this point where we're talking about a game that was actually released in the past year and so we want people to play it but yeah. um, that's one of the things where it's not obvious what's going to happen but it does have repercussions later on in the game yeah and it, 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 come back, it comes back once it comes back again in a, in a kind of different way um, and it's the weight to those consequences weren't because they were huge, big, grand events, and those come along again. The cataclysmic, no one is safe. That happens a couple of times for for different reasons, but just there's a weight to everything because it leaves an impression. Well, what's what's interesting as well is in pretty much any game ever, even the ones that are, do have good weighty decisions like your mass effects and things, you've got the good decision or the bad one. You can choose to kill somebody or show mercy. You can choose to, you know. Take I don't know, take a head or save somebody, or whatever. But Walking Dead's much more like real life, where it's just two crap decisions, and you mm. have to choose between two bad things. It's like which one of these two people dies? Um, am I going to lie and tell people I'm not a mass murderer, or I'm going to tell them that I murdered somebody? It's like yeah. what what bad decision are we going to make here? And so it's like as I was saying before, when you go back to characters in movies doing stupid things, and this one. You are like every every decision's like a small moment of tension, like a little bit of mm. agony creeping in because you don't want to make any decision at all. And in fact, that's also an option as well. It doesn't necessarily force you to do anything. You can just remain silent. Well, that's that's one of the things that makes um, that's been introduced in how it handled dialogue. A lot of the game, the Talking Dead. You're really um, <laughs> it's, it's what you say. But one of the interesting things is they just put a timer on your responses. Yeah, and then as you said, there's always the bottom response of just saying nothing, you can let that timer run out. I don't know about you, but I only did it a couple of times. I did it a wee bit at the start of chapter two, I think, and then after that I did, I became more resolute that I was going to make decisions. Yeah, I always felt sort of compelled to, to speak up and to say things, but there was certainly one moment where just you walk into a room and there's a fight going on in the group. We mm-hmm. can't take risks like this, and we can't just let people die either. When I say that door stays shut no matter what, I fucking mean it. We don't know who these people are. They could be dangerous. Worse, they could have let them right to us. 
Where the hell is your humanity? And you can see it's escalating, and the camera's kind of cir circling around everyone. And I was just kind of like, hey, I'm not involved here. I don't know what you're fighting for. And the options were kind of take this guy's side, take the other guy's side. And I was just like, hey, I'm staying out of this one. Don't think it's going to get any heated. And then I got flack for that. Someone else has come up and was like, why didn't you do anything? Why did you just stand there? I guess the one the one problem with the whole storyline and, well, I don't know if it's necessarily a problem, it's just the way it is, is that it's not a story that branches out. So you, I mean, if you imagine a lot of game stories are kind of these pyramidal type things where you pick one decision and that moves you on to one of two paths, you've got another two decisions and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, so it branches out. It's kind of like, you know, the old outrun arcade game where you pick different stages and it takes you to different levels and then it's like, X number of possible endings. Or like a probability tree when you're yeah. trying to figure out the quantum like state I, of an electron. I'm doing that thing where I try to do something visual and talk about it and it just falls flat. So anyway, yeah. Walking Dead is more a story that bends rather than branches. So yes, you make decisions, but you always get pulled back onto this overall weaving narrative. Mm -hmm. And that, it's not just a design decision. It's not just like, this is the way we decided to do it. It's also... I guess it's also a comment on the way things actually are. It's like whenever you're in this apocalyptic situation, you don't have a lot of options. And so you are, it's not necessarily destiny, but you're put in this path. And yes, you can change some things, but events were always working up to this point in the story. And even the big decisions that you make, like who lives and who dies, don't necessarily affect the story as much as you thought it would. Well, traditionally, the test of a branching story was when you look at the extremes. Yeah. So if you went all the way to the left, what does that look like compared to if you made every decision to the right? Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that means that even in the simplest, most binary case, it means that the, the team need to write two games. They mm -hmm. need to make two games. They need to have the voice actors go in and deliver two different performances to every question. With The Walking Dead, they very clearly had their one story that they told. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it bends. And the people who you have with you on that journey can change and can swap out. And that's where it's fascinating watching it, uh, someone else play yeah, well, an episode. Yeah, yesterday, um, yesterday I finished it. Um, I completed episode five, and uh, Craig was watching me mm -hmm. play it. And uh, it was things like, uh, oh, well, let's just chuck in a, a small spoiler. It was, uh, did you cut your arm off? And yeah. I was like, and I didn't cut my arm off. And uh, so we were watching it. Um, through this perspective of knowing that I could have lost an arm and watching me suspiciously do everything with my right arm. Yeah. <laughs> so they, 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 but, they, you do the same things regardless of how many arms you have, which is weird, but that's mm -hmm. the way they've done it, where you feel it's an illusion. It's like all, all good magicians don't reveal the secret of the trick. Yeah. By speaking to other people, you... You know, but yeah, by speaking to other people about things, it does break the illusion a little because you know what you could do and what you couldn't do. But even in that moment where... Do you do you hack off the arm or do you not? The way that the characters were interacting was very different from mm -hmm. what I saw. You have one of the characters very much on your side. From the second I saw this chap, I was had it in for him. So every decision has been against him. Um, so okay, I mean, even though you your thing went a different way, tonally it completely had branched off in a different mode. You're, and it was you're talking about Kenny, aren't you? Yeah, because I I was like oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna befriend him. He seems like a good guy, but the problem was that he was a continuous dick throughout the game. But I felt like well, I've kind of put my eggs in this basket, and he wasn't as bad as Lily's dad. What do you call him? Uh, I don't remember Lily's dad. Lily's dad, the the guy. The, I mean, everybody who's played this game will know he's that really annoying guy that just does not trust you at all and knows you're knows you're a murderer. You must really hate me. But guess what? You're stuck with me. I plan to be around long after you're gone. And if you turn, I'll be the one to put the axe through your skull. I'm not your enemy, Larry. I don't believe you. Don't forget, I know who you really are. So I was like, I was gonna, I was siding with Kenny because Kenny was against that guy. And then mm -hmm. the problem was because I'd sided with Kenny, then he comes into conflict with Lily and you're like, oh, what, did I pick the right side? But... Regardless of what side you take, things happen anyway. Yeah, yeah. And there's certain times where, if you look at, if you just imagined all the possible variations you could have on a decision. So say, save a person, don't save a person. Okay, maybe, and then that person anyway is going to die. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you tried to save them, then was very clever by the way is that you, you still feel that loss. Yeah. Whereas if you chose to get rid of them, then you can. That's a different reaction to the same scene, to the same consequence. It's the same. It's a different. Uh, experience that you're getting it's a kind of very thing. minimal performance none of that was in the game that's kind of just in your own head and 
because the writing's so good at sucking you in very early on and getting you attached to these characters. Poor Clementine, all the time you're sort of rooting for Clementine. It's one of these things where, um, you know, one of the things I really don't care about, and I used to care about a lot in games, is replay values. People were like, mm. you know, oh, mm. it's, a, it's a really good game, and it's got really poor replay value. And yeah. over the past few years, I've kind of become resolute, saying I don't care. I've played Skyrim for 80 hours, and I've had my fill. I've played Mass Effect once, and yeah, I'd like to play it again with another character, but I'm, it doesn't necessarily matter to me. What matters to me is it's good the first time that I play it. But with The Walking Dead... Even though you think, oh, it's quite a linear story and not that much is going to change, it actually is the kind of game I'd really like to play again, just to make different decisions and see what changes. Like, even in a dude, I kind of, oh, save Carly this time, so I'm going to save Tech Guy this time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to side with an um, old heart attack guy, and I'm not going to side with Kenny and see how that plays out. I think that'd be really interesting, just getting a better feel for the systems and what's going on under the hood and what you could change and what you couldn't. Because mm-hmm. this is the thing where any game that introduces decisions, there's one in the first Mass Effect game where... Um, Rex is going to like try and kill somebody in the team he's basically had enough and okay. you can talk him down but you can only talk him down if your speech is above a certain level mm-hmm. and then that kind of sets up so many things across the trilogy where you're like could I have done this could I have saved this person um, and I think I talk about it a bit in my Mass Effect 3 review and, and Walking Dead is another one of those games you're like oh you did that have to happen yeah. did I make the wrong decision did I say the wrong thing you see it's very interesting that you said that you want you would you would replay it again um, I loved it, but I don't think I would. Certainly not any time soon. It'll be a couple of years before I really well, go back into yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to now, immediately go back and play it again. But when but. I was playing it, uh, there's kind of two, kind of thinking about it on two different levels. So on, on, on the first level, there's just the looking at this from a kind of a product view, I guess. Like, how have they done it then? Like a technical point of view. How have they put in the branches? Where are they? Mm-hmm. One of the things I loved, I didn't quite realise where branching paths were. No. There's a couple of times where there's... You have to get to a character to say something to them, and there's actually a time limit on you. There's a time pressure, I, and I failed it, but I only realised that because I spoke to a friend who hadn't failed it, and I was like, "Oh my god, I didn't even realise there's an opportunity I missed there." Mm. And that kind of enriched the other way that I look at it, which is just on that experiential in the story. And I'm so satisfied with the experience that I had. I'm not happy with every decision I made. No. And sometimes that unhappiness came immediately after saying it, going, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I've just fucked up the whole group. <laughs> See, I'm, but, kinda, I'm one of these perfectionist types where I want to I want to get everything. It's not that I want to get all the achievements because I want the achievements. Mm-hmm. I want to get them all because I know I've done everything in the game. And it's just one of those things where you can't. That's why the first the first episode is like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. But when you get into the second one, you're like, right, let's just make a choice and we'll live with it and we'll see how well, it goes. Well, that's for me because every decision that I made was my kind of true decision it wasn't like a uh, uh, it was the one that I was sort of playing on if I was in this world mm-hmm. um, this is what I'm doing you know the, I ain't doing this to the kid we're keeping we're keeping them safe I was like that, that was the kind yeah. of thought pattern it wasn't oh well you know I guess actually this person's got you know this benefit and uh, maybe I'll push it this way and we'll, we'll play lawful good this time or oh, we'll play chaotic <laughs> evil this time because I made every decision very true to how I feel mm-hmm. it feel fake going through it again and it felt so real the first time yeah, that, I'm, well, it, and I'm still vibing off of that feeling, that good feeling. Well, that's a that's a that's a fair point to make. It's going it, to be yeah. a while before I go back to it, and I, I think that's a complete testament to I, how good it is. I mean, I don't want to sound too much like a new games journalist here, but you know, if you're playing it the second time, you're very much playing it. But the first time, you're feeling it. You know, the first mm. time you're doing what you think is right, and the second time. I would do the same things, so I kind of need to deliberately go against myself in order to pick a different path, which is which and, is fine from a kind of analytical point of view, but it's not necessarily the way it was meant to be experienced. And in terms of, as we said, with the storytelling, they had their one story, and there's one moment, and it is about halfway through the season, where there's kind of a reset on uh, your party, the number mm-hmm. of people you're yeah. with. And I think that was quite smart, really, for them to do that, because the decision that you're making would branch off over a couple of episodes. So it didn't get unwieldy. The thing didn't go extreme left or extreme right. Mm -hmm. You kind of went off a little bit, but then you came back and everyone came back together. So it meant that when we were talking about it after each episode, we we still had kind of a lot of the same things to talk about. And then it was the differences between them. It's just it's just a cleverly designed game, I think. I mean, we before we started this podcast, we we're thinking about you know why is it the best game we've played this year because that's mm. ultimately what we're talking about here, and that 
I mean, Telltale have done quite a lot of adventure games yeah. now, and they're this is one of the, the first ones where they've actually done something kind of new, because generally what they did was they built on existing franchises, so they did Tales of Monkey Island, they did mm-hmm. Sam and Max, those are classic adventures. They did the Back to the Future one, which I believe wasn't that good. Um, the Back to the Future Jurassic Park were the weaker ones. Puzzle Agent as well, which was oh, their, I, yeah, their original Agent, one. It, was, uh, it, it fell down. The High Water Mark is still Sam and Max Season 3. It, it, you, it, it's nice because you're you're very much seeing the work of a studio who are at the top of their game. Yeah. You know they've they've really nailed down the art style. Um, you don't really get stuck in any of the puzzles because I mean as we've said, there's not that many gamey bits to speak of. And that was a criticism I saw. People said, oh well, there's not a lot of not a lot of game parts. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you know, what's life like? It was a zombie apocalypse all about shooting endless waves of zombies. Probably not. Like, you only have those kind of flash points of action, and a lot of the, the point of the game is the dialogue. So it's a silly, it's a silly criticism to make because it's it's this whole thing about you know, well, what's a game and what isn't, and it's like the whole Metal Gear Solid Two thing, complaining there wasn't much game in it. It's like yeah, but but the story is the game, the dialogue is the game. I still think they they, they paced the game very well. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, there's no points you, where you feel like there's a lot of downtime. Or no, anything like I mean, that. if you if you look at one extreme saying like being like the heavy rain David Cage type of games which are entirely talky really yeah um, yeah I mean well I mean Fahrenheit was the only one I've, I haven't played heavy rain yet okay. but Fahrenheit's the only one I've finished and there, there's a few actiony bits, and actually those are the bits that let the game down. It's the same mm-hmm. with The Walking Dead. There's bits where you have very sudden, like kind of quick time actions where you're not expecting it, and it's like the old. Um, I guess you probably haven't played Shenmue, but no. the Shenmue, it's. I mean, it was kind of the. Like, I guess it was the, the archetype for all of these games where you had, it was the first game that it just quick time events and those mm-hmm. kind of things, and. In Shenmue, the only punishment for failing a cutscene is to do it again immediately. It's the same thing with The Walking Dead, and the punishment is that it it, it breaks your, your kind of concentration. It, it spoils the the illusion of being completely absorbed into this thing. But it's it, the same with The Walking Dead. If where... they were able to apply sort of some of the stuff they managed to do in the dialogue, where say you didn't do, it. I'm thinking now every time a quick time event came up, I was there mashing Q. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering now if there were times where maybe you didn't have to, and it wouldn't result in a hard fail. Yeah. So if there was a time where you're say fighting someone else down to try calm them down, well, what if you just let them go off the rails? And again, we've seen they've proven that that doesn't mean it needs to branch off in a completely different direction. It can just give you a different uh, vibe, a uh, different kind of mm. something a bit more subtle. That can but come there out were there were quite a few outcome. like there were quite a few of the quick time events that I did fail and I ended up getting walloped in the face and things and yeah, people punching and, me and it, it didn't end the game, but I think there's one bit, possibly in the second episode, that was quite a tough bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you had to be really fast in your reactions, and I found that quite frustrating. But apart from that, I mean, you've got... The, the puzzles and things, I mean, they're, they're very basic, and I wasn't necessarily playing it because I wanted the challenge of a puzzle, but because it was so primitive, I was kind of like, really? Do we really have to go through this? Can he not, can he not figure it out himself? I think for, for me, if there was um, a criticism to come on the, those puzzle areas, it's just sometimes I felt I was a little bit ahead. I was, yeah. I was kind of part way through solving the puzzle before I'd really initiated the puzzle. And those are just little elements, rather than having the classic uh, response when you you go and you look at the ladder and he mm-hmm. goes, hmm, a ladder. You know, I kind of knew that actually I'm going to be using this. So it'd be nice if you could just pick it up and walk around with it and still maybe talk to other people. It's, but those are very yeah. minor um, they're, quibbles they're, to have. They're, but they're niggles it would go, easily set aside. <laughs> it would go a long way to make you feel that you're interacting with the world a lot more. You were interacting with the people um, to a level that I've not really had mm-hmm. before. But you weren't interacting in the world uh, in that same way. You were so very much going on and turning switches on in a certain order. No matter whether you were using a ladder, using a hammer, opening a door, starting an engine, you were just doing it sequential. What order do I need to yeah. tap these bells to get the melody to play to? I think like to what, go forward. what really, I guess what would really elevate it um, would be if they thought like all these bits when you're like, oh, we have to find something, and you look at all these cupboards and some of them are empty, and they're very much distinct units of cupboard that you lock mm-hmm. on to and click. Wouldn't it be great just to get rid of those bits and have more more dialogue and, and more interesting interactions rather than feeling that we have to sort of conform to these old puzzle and adventure game tropes? Yeah, and there's a, there's a little sense of because we've now gone through all the episodes, we know the structure, we know the the, the form mm-hmm. um, with which you can interact, sort of the limits of it. 
I, th I think back to the very opening scene when you're in the back of the police car and you're moving the mouse and you're looking around. Mm -hmm. And I remember, because I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know that there's actually, there's a symbol that means when you can interact on things. Mm -hmm. I didn't know whether or not, if I was looking at the driver too much, whether that would be freaking him out because he seemed to give me evil eyes every now and then. Yeah. So I was just kind of wandering around. And that looseness where there wasn't anything that came out of that, it wasn't an outcome in terms of what happened in the game. But for my experience of it, that felt like quite... Yeah, alive. but it makes you but it makes you feel like your decisions matter the whole way throughout and not whenever it comes to the decision point and that's where it's good is that um walking dead every every decision feels like it's got some import every every possible conversation could end up with you having your arm loved off mm, and possibly <laughs> one of the the most important things the most important reasons why this is going to resonate with so many people and has resonated with so many people is that we all went through it at the same time because it was episodic Mm -hmm. and it was being released every month so and i don't know about you but i certainly every time i played an episode i just played it was one go sit down for the two hours or however yeah, long it lasted yeah. um and it meant that then after it you would see the statistics little statistics of, yeah and you can see who made what what choices yeah 70 percent of people decided to do this 30 percent decided to do that and you're like oh actually i felt quite conflicted there but everyone else seemed <laughs> completely fine with ransacking the car i i actually thought that was wrong personally but then you could then have those discussions mm -hmm. uh, a step further if you actually then spoke to people you knew or just jump yeah, but on it's Twitter. Also, it's also good because it immediately points out what the big decisions were and it gives yeah. you a chance to talk about them. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it separates, if you like, the macro decisions from the, the micro ones that were inconsequential. I think it's, it's interesting, though, that episodic gaming was one of these things that was quite popular in the mid-90s. We had shareware games, so the first chapter would be free mm -hmm. and you'd use that as a trial and then you would automatically unlock the other three. But... It's different in the delivery of this is episodic and you paid once for the season. And okay, you're taking a little bit of a risk. I mean, this is a year of Kickstarter and mm -hmm. basically just throwing money at people and hoping they'll give you a game back. But I mean, last year, my favorite game of the year was Skyrim. And that was a game I spent 80 hours in. Yeah. And that was like, that was all I did mm -hmm. for a long time. And but there's still people me, who yeah. that's still all they do. Yeah. But it's, take, it's, it's taken me a, a year to clear most of the backlog. I'm looking over at my shelf at all the games I've cleared through. I'd managed to do Arkham City. That's a 20 to 30 hour yep. game. You know, I did well, Spec Ops The Line was quite a short 10 hours. I did uh, Mass Effect 3. That's another 30, 40 hours. You know, a lot of these games aren't very respectful of my time. I mean, I've got a full-time job now. I want to interact mm -hmm. with other human beings. And so it's nice I've got two hours. I can actually sit down and play The Walking Dead and I've I've done something that I feel is significant. Yeah. It's not like if I fire up, I don't know, something like Civilization, like, oh, great, I made two turns. What did you do? Built a farm? It's like, <laughs> you know, it, well, doesn't, the, it doesn't feel like you've actually done anything. And so you're always you're always coming back and thinking, oh, where was I last time? And trying to mm -hmm. get your bearings. Like, I've started to play L.A. Noir. Yeah. Um, and it took me and my girlfriend about three goes to finish the first tutorial mission because we kept turning it on and then quitting before the end of the tutorial, coming back again mm -hmm. and going, oh, how do we move? How do we drive this car? And then it only it took us about three goes before we actually had a decent go of it and got through a few missions. Yeah. Whereas imagine if L.A. Noir was this episodic thing where at least a couple of cases every few months and you could sort of, almost like you're watching oh, a TV it? show serial, it it'd be does, really good. And... and that episodic um, structure kind of came, it was like around 2006, obviously the first most profile one was Half-Life 2 Episode 1. Well, um, which, which was almost like a, an expansion pack, it was, just, it was episodic and it's, only in name. But it's, I, know, I, know what you, I know what you're, I know what you're getting but at. There were, but there were other, my point that I'm going to make, there were other games that came out, so Sins had episode, uh, episodic nature mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on them. There were a couple others that came out, and then Telltale also uh, kind of emerged then with the Sam and Max episodes. Mm -hmm. And off all of them, Half Life episodes have become like the Star Wars episodes. So there's years apart from them, and who uh, knows when Episode Three is going to come out if it's ever Sonic, come Sonic out. Four is the other one. Sonic um, Four episodes yeah. as well, most recently. Um, but Telltale were the only ones who ever made, managed to make the business model aspect of it work. Mm. But so, what you're saying about L.A. Noir and the way they structure those chapters, they could put out that one disc of 100 hours or however long it is. Think of how Portal 2 was um, released. There were discrete chapters in that as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just something as simple as that, just saying, like, actually, you're at a resting point now. So you can you can walk away from this and you're not going to feel yeah. like you're in the middle of well, something. L.A. You... LA Noir, actually, I mean, I've only got to the... You kind of do a cop on, on the beat for a couple mm -hmm. of cases and then you do traffic cop and vice cop and arson detective so you could do distinct 
rules within that if you like yeah. and do a few cases from each i think the difference between something like the telltale ones compared to say half-life episodes or sin episodes or um sonic episodes is that they were set up with the idea that let's do the first episode mm -hmm. if it's a success we'll make more whereas the walking dead was here is one full complete game and we're going to release it in five episodes well, so it was always set up that way from the get-go and i'm sure monkey island and sam and max were the same where yeah. their seasons they're not here's sin episode one we're sin episode two i don't know we didn't make enough copies well, well uh, there's, there's with um i'm re reminded of another one which was um grim's uh, it was uh, American McGee, Grim, oh, yeah, Grim yeah. Fairy Tales. I forget Fig the exact name of the title. But what he said is that actually they had about three or four of them in the bag, fully, uh, episodes developed before the first issue was mm -hmm. came out. And then it was a case of, we can see how long this is kind of going to go. They've got all these things planned out, but in terms of them working, yeah, they're slightly ahead of the curve. And that's much more like American TV shows. Mm -hmm. You've got your pilot and then a couple of ones after. But really it's the success of those first episodes that's going to determine whether yeah. they're the investment uh, continues. So you're saying about you know the comics are the comics are going down in history as yeah. being these excellent comic books, and that's within the kind of the comic sphere. Mm -hmm. the TV show, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, but I mean, my, I was actually speaking to my brother about it the other day, and he said I should get back into it because season three was really good. But where do you think it fits into the the zombie mythos then? Because it does quite a lot of things that have been even zombie taboo. And considering these are monsters that just eat other people, you know, you've got uh, zombie kids. Zombie kids. You have to you have to squash a zombie kid's head. The children weren't safe. Yeah, the children weren't safe, and uh, very true in the comments. Oh, the children weren't safe from any of the horrors that the adults were going to get. Be that murder, suicide, accidental death, and then they come back again as a zombie and and hit all of those things mm -hmm. again. It actually was quite an interesting. Um, if they're trying to spoil it too much, is that there are a couple of suicides in the story, and yeah. there's a speech one of the characters gives about you know not committing suicide and not get you know not giving up and how that's that's not what you do. Smart. Think all the people we've seen go. They got to do it their own way. Together. Don't you say that. You stick it out as long as you can. You do whatever you have to. I could have done more. There's no use dwelling on it. You know that. No, Lee. I could have been a better husband. Better father. Could have been a better friend. So let's figure out a way out of here. Get that little girl. We should move. Yeah. Got at least one shot left. It's good because it treats it in a mature way. Mm -hmm. The whole the whole thing is done with a, a, a real sense of maturity that these things aren't trivialized. That's the problem with like, you know, Gears of War 2. Well, Call of Duty comes you know, to mind as a game Jews which would me. perhaps not be able to handle that or tackle it in a way which didn't feel sensationalism. I mean, because think about it, for all the... This is a this is a bleak game. It's very much in the vein of uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. This is a bleak world with very little future. Yeah, no hope. <laughs> if you think about from where your characters are at the end of episodes five to the beginning, in terms of their personalities, their history, they've changed. They, there's been an arc there, but in terms of the world, nothing has been achieved. No, yeah, in fact, no one has achieved not... nothing. And if anything, they've lost a lot more yeah. than they, they will have gained. But for all of that macabre stuff that's happened here, it's not sensationalized. No, no. Well, it's it's treated with a lot of well, a lot of subtlety. And okay, there's moments of extreme violence, but there's also moments of, like of subdued violence where your mind mm -hmm. fills in the blanks. It's like it doesn't it doesn't rely on gore for a shock factor. It relies on the consequences of actions being the shock mm -hmm. factor. And I guess in a way that is more it's something we can relate to more as as viewers. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you can understand why a decision would be shocking, but we've been so desensitized to to violence now. So it's good that. I mean, there's a year where we, we sort of complained about the prevalence of ultraviolence and about, mm -hmm. like, you know, people getting murdered really gratuitously. So it's interesting to have a game that is, like, at face value, yeah, it's extremely violent, but also not. Mm -hmm. It's also handled in a way where the violence is justified because it's a, not because it's a violent world, but because, you know, it's just that that's kind of the way it is and people are doing what they need to survive. Well, well that's part of the zombie mythos. It's all about fighting for survival. Mm -hmm. But it's also about not losing your humanity yeah and well, what, that, yeah whenever whenever the whenever the apocalypse comes along you know it's like what what parts of our culture do we hold on to and which mm -hmm. parts do we jettison that's uh, but it, I, I think mean, it's it a, it's a, a lot of interesting things to say about that i forget exactly when it happens in the comics it is it's, 
It's a good 30 or 40 issues into it anyway. <laughs> and the line's not delivered particularly subtly, but that's, that's uh, Rick's conclusion, is that we are the walking dead. That it's, it's, a, it's one of the moments of reflection where they go back over everything that's happened. And um, that happens in episode five uh, appropriately. Mm-hmm. You have little moments where they just recap some of the stuff that you've done or the characters recap things that you've done. And for a couple of them, I was like, oh yeah, that happened. We were at the farm. That was the thing that happened. And it was like, almost just like dealt with it and put it away. And then just tried to move on and struggle Mm. forward. Um, But it's funny how whenever you're playing games, that's what happens. You go from one location to the next. You go to the, you know, desert world, ice world, Mm. lava land. And well, it's like you're walking down the strip at Las Vegas. You know, you've got the Egyptian world, pirate world, medieval (laughs) world, circus world. So it's nice for somebody to remind you, hey, that happened. And not just, hey, that happened. That was a thing. It's like, hey, that happened. And there were consequences to Mm. that. Oh dear, just a just a, a a great game in general. I think we could talk about it for maybe twice as long. Yeah, there's a lot of um. I don't know how interesting that would be for everybody else, but I would find it interesting. <laughs> 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 so, what was like? What was your sort of best and worst moment for you, like in the game? Best and worst moment? Yeah, I'm trying to think of any moments that made me feel like a a real a real badass, but it really wasn't that kind of a game. I think I think the best decisions I made were to be honest with people. Mm. Those were the bits that made me feel good about myself was not lying about my past and trying to be upfront and honest with people because, I mean, I guess it's a kind of real-life cliche, but it, it really was the best policy because then nobody could throw it back in your face because you're honest with them. And so you made a decision, you made a difficult one up front, but it's also a way to kind of hedge your bets where nobody could throw it back in your face. Yeah, no, that's, that's um, quite an interesting one. I think the worst decision I made... Um, I debated about the taking food from the car, mm. and I think that I mean I chose to 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 steal the food from the car, and I think in hindsight I might not have done that, but it was it wasn't because of later things that transpired in the story. It's because of Clementine's immediate reaction, mm. and this is the whole thing where she's kind of like your moral compass in a way, and um, you always felt like you were you were letting her down, which is good because there was immediate feedback to a lot of your decisions as well. You know, even if the ramifications took a while to get going, she's yeah. always like, oh shit, and you know. What 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 does Clementine think of this? And there's mm-hmm. moments where she just ran away crying, and you kind of felt like a like a bad dad. <laughs> yeah, so you can't handle uh, the relationship. Yeah. You're trying to so preserve that, that. That's when I felt bad that I, you know, come the zombie apocalypse, that I wouldn't be a good dad because you know that's my <laughs> least things that keeps me up at night. <laughs> it was um, it's it was quite similar to that. So my my kind of best moment was really that um, there was a certain strategy, a certain character early on. I was like, okay, I'm sort of interested in them. I'm, I'm going to side with them, and then suddenly they were taken out of the equation. And my whole world up to that point had been directed with with them in mind. It was like it's me and them against ev- not against everyone else, but if I need to choose, we need to protect. It's going to be me and me and her. And when she then was taken out of the picture, I then switched everything on to Clementine completely, and I was like, okay, now you are my world. And then a couple of episodes down the line, something emerges. Like one of the cliffhangers emerges that actually. That might not have been a wise decision. You might have now led the group into, uh, Total into disarray, danger. Yeah. And so that was a great moment for me because it was like, oh, God, I can't do anything right in the end of that episode. Obviously, I knew, you know, that was where we were going. We are going to Savannah regardless. But the reasons in my head, not in the game, the reasons in my head for why we were going there were now uh, void. <laughs> we're now <laughs> gone. So what was your worst moment? Uh, worst moment was... Was actually it was the one I spoke about earlier where there, there was a time pressure moment and I didn't even realize it. Because how how good is that in an apocalypse? Is you like everyone else is like we gotta make a decision and then I'm just there in the corner thinking we got time, <laughs> and then they like, look up and like oh they're eating people oh that's a shame oh no oh, <laughs> oh no <laughs> you're talking about you're talking about the bit at the end of the farmhouse and the end of the farm. See, I, and I knew it as well because I'd read the road, and there's something very similar yeah. in moments there of that. Um, of that. How do you, the very end of it is like a proper gut punching ending, cold end, it's a, cold it's, end. Uh, it's pretty, no music uh, until after the credits mm-hmm. kick up. But uh, so, do you think this is going to be something we we talk about for years to come? Do you think um, are you looking forward to the second season? Um, uh, obviously, yeah, definitely looking forward to the second season. If there's something that I would wish that other developers and publishers would learn. Certainly on the publishing front, it's the the length, the length of the games. Yeah. The fact that we could fit this into our Lives, kind of yeah. our, our, our kind of our work lifestyles now, um, and the fact that it came out at this sort of regular pace, 
um, and it was sized for like normal people with a sort of couple hours to kill. And then on the developer point, just that branching paths don't need to throw you completely onto different roads. Yeah. Um, they can just bend, as you said, and not not break off. Again, you're kind of back to the the Mass Effect mm -hmm. problem where they have you know about so many ridiculous yeah. numbers of combinations of endings that they couldn't and possibly end everything in a way that satisfied everybody. Yeah. But that was their fault for branching out the story that much. And just that simple. Simple, simple mechanic of putting a time pressure when you have to talk to someone. Because one of the, the worst things in an RPG, we're game breaking things, you can just let it sit there and the shopkeeper's just looking at you. Yeah. And they're just looking at you. And then you make a decision and they, they then deliver the performance as if uh, nothing's happened and you, you made that choice instantly. Forcing people to make that choice, that was something that I never really had um, without it being like a, an instant death, quick time event thing. No. So. I think I think if I had a final take home message for uh, anybody that's managed to make it this far and hasn't you know stopped their audio player would be like you need to leave your preconceptions at the door for this the fact that it is a game the fact that it's another game about zombies the fact that it comes from a, st a kind of heritage of point and click adventures none of those things matter and it is it is different and I think it is important and I think in time it will be seen hopefully as a kind of turning point for things like the the style of the game the nature of decisions it, it's it's not necessarily like a, a real seminal title. It's just a kind of nice milestone along the way in terms of maturity and where the mediums come. It's certainly, it's not something I can imagine playing 10 years ago or even five years ago. Mm. It's like if you look, I mean, it's 2012 now, you, five years ago you had like Bioshock and things, which was one of the last sort of great games. But it, it's just, you couldn't yeah. imagine these kind of decisions, these kind of consequences being in Sam and Max or being in Tales yeah. of Monkey Island. And so that's really, it's really good to be at this point where games are reaching this emotional maturity. I but think, I think more people need to play it. I mean, need, I mean, ultimately for me, is there's, there's just the quality of the writing and the performance and a level of intimacy that they were able to have. And it was a very quiet game at points. Mm -hmm. But all throughout it, even in the, the louder moments, there's no doubt in my mind that they made the game that they wanted to make. Mm -hmm. It feels that they, there's no compromise, and sometimes that conflicted with what I wanted, but that <laughs> that fits into the world. You don't always get what you want, and um, it, it was just great to see that come out. As, as we said earlier, it's developer on the top of their uh, top of their game, I and mean, that's just always great to see. I can't believe we made it through this entire podcast and didn't make any zombie puns. That's because we've got very good brains, Alan. Delicious brains. Brain. <laughs> brain. Oh no. Brain. Will, will we call it a will we call it a cast? Brain. <laughs>